is look in in some detail at the way that proxy indicators can be used for um, evaluation around GBV prevention work. Um, as Ife has just made possible, we're going to record this session. Um, and I just need to be clear with all of you about the purpose of that recording and what we're going to do with it. It's, it's purely really for, for learning objectives. So what we'll be doing is sharing a version of this workshop online um, so that other organizations can check in and find out some of the learnings around proxy indicators and hopefully some of the challenges that we uncover together as we discuss some of the strengths and weaknesses of the approach. Um, so that's the purpose. It will be publicly available. We will not be recording the breakout groups. So you can say what you want in the breakout groups. You don't need to worry. But when we're in plenary, um, we will be uh, putting that information up on the interaction website for other people to, to refer to in the future. Um, so um, with that said, uh, what we'll be doing is covering proxy indicators across two different workshops, one today and then one on Thursday. Um, you should have all the details sent to you from Kerry before, so you should be good for the timings. Um, but we're really just going to focus on proxy indicators here. We're not going to look at all the all the other aspects in detail of, of the framework. We're just going to look at how they can be used. So I'm going to start off by just introducing some of the backgrounds. So the basics of the risk equation as a tool for understanding gender-based violence risk. Um, and that might not seem related to proxy indicators, but it will come back later on Thursday when we look at how to interpret the data that comes from these types of indicator. So it's important that we look briefly at the risk equation and, and what it can provide us at project level when it comes to understanding risk. Um, and then I'll talk through the theory of proxy indicators themselves, what they are, crucially what they are not, um, and then how to go about designing a good sort of bundle of proxy indicators for your program. We'll also discuss some of the strengths and weaknesses of using them. Um, there is, there's a lot to, to take in and to consider and it's all quite context dependent. So I think what would be most useful for these two sessions is just to have an open conversation amongst ourselves about problems that we might foresee around using this type of indicator. Um, and then we're also going to do some practice. So we'll have a breakout session, particularly on Thursday, where we'll, I'll ask you to try and design some proxy indicators for a fictional um, GBV prevention project that I will explain to you on Thursday. Um, and what we're going to do there is think about how to design them and then also how to critique and how to interpret the data that they might produce. So listen, everybody, um, like we said, we're going to kick off with a little bit of background about um, the interaction um, GBV prevention evaluation framework before we dive into the real details on, on the proxy uh, indicators work. So for that, I'm going to hand over to Kerry, who is at interaction right now in DC, um, who's going to talk us through that wider framework from which the work that we do today and Thursday has been drawn. Um, so she can give you a good background on the sort of the breadth of the framework itself. Over to you, Kerry. Thanks, Neil. I hope you all can hear me okay. I just had a, some issue with my speaker in the breakout group. Okay, thanks, Neil. So, hi everyone. My name is Carrie. I'm a senior project coordinator for protection at Interaction. So, as Neil mentioned, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about the GBV PEF um, and how this workshop situates within our work on that GBV PEF. Um, so between 2019 and 2021, our team at Interaction facilitated the development of this evaluation framework to measure GBV prevention that we called GBV PEF. And that effort involved an advisory group of about 15 organizations and a steering group with um, six GBV and m and &E experts from different organizations. And when we started this project back in 2019, uh, we started by commissioning a scoping study um, that looked at current GBV prevention strategies being used. Um, and some of the key findings from that are up here on the screen, um, things like not really great context specific analysis of GBV risk patterns that people are experiencing in different crisis settings. Very few context specific theories of change underpinning interventions and programs. Uh, an overall focus on outputs versus outcomes of reduced GBV risk. Um, a lot of missing baseline data, lack of appropriate monitoring plans, um, very little focus on prevention in general, and just overall the evidence base for effective GBV prevention um, programs or strategies was 
pretty weak. Um, no study was able to determine an intervention to be effective at preventing GBV, although there were a few promising results that the researchers found. So <clears throat> the GBV PEF um, was designed based on recommendations that came out of that scoping study, uh, as well as a series of field level workshops that we did uh, in um, places like Afghanistan, South Sudan, Nigeria, the DRC, um, Colombia, and then Cox's Bazar. And so we ended up launching this evaluation framework, the GBV PEF, in May of last year. Um, and it's for any organization that is working to prevent GBV from occurring within humanitarian settings. It's specifically geared towards field-based practitioners, but also their HQ level protection um, or GBV uh, and ME advisors. So it's, it's really designed to overcome many of the challenges that exist um, that came out in the scoping study and that members of the advisory committee are very familiar with. Um, and so the PEF is a set of approaches and it's to help practitioners better analyze GBV risks, design programs and monitoring frameworks so that ultimately we can evaluate whether GBV was prevented or not. And it's made up of four modules. You can see them up on the screen as well and the focus of each one. And within these modules, there are more than a dozen uh, different results-based methodologies and tools, including proxy indicators. Um, but others as well, um, like outcome harvesting, and which we actually did a similar style workshop on in December and repeated again in January, given the big interest that we had in that. Um, and some of the others methodologies are things like um, most significant change, uh, process tracing and others. So there's a lot more in the GBV PEF than just what we're covering today. Proxy indicators is just one of the many methodologies um, and tools within that, the broader evaluation framework. And so since launching the GBV PEF last year, our team at Interaction, we've been disseminating and promoting this framework, encouraging practitioners to start using it um, or parts of it that make sense for wherever you are in your programs. Um, and so this workshop is one way for us to provide support for organizations who are using the PEF or are interested in using it and to dive deeper into one of those methodologies. Um, another way that we're providing support to practitioners using the PEF or interested in it is via a community of practice that we launched on February 1st. Um, and this community of practice uh, provides a dedicated space for those who are using the PEF to connect with each other, learn from each other's experiences, uh, to raise questions about the methodologies, share you know, challenges or successes, uh, and just find ways to collaborate with each other. And so aside from connecting with other practitioners on the community of practice platform, our team uh, at Interaction, me and my colleagues were in, uh, in, engaged on that and we can provide technical support from protection GPV side. And we also bring in outside experts as needed. So for example, um, right now we have Neil who's leading this workshop today. And as he mentioned, code um, drafted the GBV PEF itself. He's available to provide m and &E technical support via the community of practice. And we'll bring on other experts in the future based on the, the requests that are coming out of that. So it's really a great opportunity for those who are piloting the PEF or are hoping to. And so if your team is using the GBV PEF or parts of it, or even just the proxy indicators that we're covering today, please do uh, apply to join the community of practice. Uh, I can put a, a link to a blog post um, that has a bit more information about the community of practice and uh, the application links to join. Um, I'll put that in the chat after this. And then if anyone has questions, feel free, you can write to me in the chat or you can just follow up with me after. You should all have my email by now. Um, otherwise, just to say thanks so much everyone for joining us. I hope um, you'll have a good time today. And otherwise, just hand over to you, Neil, to get us going. Thank you, Kerry. Really appreciate that. And I would also echo that point that we appreciate you all sharing your time with us today. There's a lot going on. Um, so we appreciate you sparing the time to join us. Um, so let's get cracking because there is quite a fair bit to get through. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of what we're going to get through today, um, we've just gone through the welcome and introductions. What I'm going to do next is present to you the kind of the basics of the results based protection framework and its applications to GBV, particularly focusing on the risk equation. Um, and then we're going to have a brief discussion of how that relates to the work that you do. 
it's quite important that we do that so that we all have a handle on what we do in our own organizations that is similar to the type of work that Interaction has been advocating for um, through the results-based protection framework. Um, once we've done that, I'll introduce proxy indicators as a tool, um, talk through kind of what they are and, and how they're developed. Um, and then we'll have a brief discussion or, or rather a breakout exercise around when is a good time to use proxies and when is a bad time. So the different types of project context where you might feel you need to reach for a proxy indicator as opposed to a context where you think, no, no, I can do this with other types of tools. Um, that's a good point for us to grasp today before we go into the details of how to develop them and how to make them good and how to interpret them. Um, so once we've done that exercise, we'll come back for a feedback, a sort of plenary discussion around that uh, before wrapping up today's session at um, 9.50 to 10 o'clock Washington DC time which I think is of no use to anybody here. None of us are actually on DC time apart from interaction, but, but there you go. So that's what we'll be doing. Um, so let's kick off with that sort of introduction to the RBP framework and its application to GBV, to gender-based violence. Um, RBP is a results-based approach to protection activities. And it consists primarily of sort of three core elements. One is on protection risk analysis, one is on the use of multidisciplinary strategies to design and respond to the risks identified. And then the last is on the use of outcome oriented strategies throughout. Each of those three pillars applies in a gender based violence prevention context. So what you've got on the slide is a brief kind of spelling out of what that might look like. So if you're focusing on gender based violence as opposed to other types of protection risk, this is the type of uh, issues that you'd need to, to take into account in order to call your approach a results-based protection approach to GBV. So just walking through that briefly, on the risk analysis, um, interaction has been quite clear about what it means to do that, to do that in a results-based way. So that would include identifying specific threats, not just generalized GBV threats, but specific threats in the context, and then identifying who is vulnerable to which threat, which risk and why. So there may be in one context, multiple GBV risks and multiple GBV threats. Um, and then it's important to disaggregate which types of people, which groups of people are vulnerable to the particular threats in question. Um, as well as that, it's important to look at community capacities to reduce those threats themselves, pre-existing community capacities before we intervene. And of course, to disaggregate those risk patterns across sex, gender, and, and other uh, identity groups, including non-binary groups. Um, and then lastly, to look at the analysis of, of pre-existing harmful uh, practices, including harmful customs, practices, laws, or, or beliefs and norms. So all of those elements are quite important for a results-based protection approach to the risk analysis side of, of GBV work. But when it comes to implementation and, and program design, um, I think the emphasis is on, as I said, multidisciplinarity multidisciplinar um, as well as outcome orientation. So on the multidisciplinary front, I think the main point is to make sure that we are analyzing external actors and drivers beyond the program itself, looking for multi-sector collaboration right from the get-go, right at design stage, and identifying quite a wide group of stakeholders with whom we can partner when responding to GBB risks that have been identified. And then lastly, on the outcome orientation of our work, um, interaction is very clear about the use of context specific theories of change. So it's a bit of a jargon phrase, but really what we're talking about is not relying on generalized ideas of how we can overcome gender based violence in a particular setting, but rather building a very specific theory of change for this particular community and this particular set of GBV risks that we've identified in the risk analysis, and then understanding how our activities will respond to those risks. Um, and then in addition, the use of outcome monitoring using some of the tools that we have in the GBV PEF to track the reduction of that risk through our interventions, and then investment in, in reflection and review and adaptation uh, following that. So that's kind of essentially what we think of when we're talking about an RBP approach to GBV. And of course, if all of that's in place, then we can start to really think about the outcome of our work as being reducing context specific threats, reducing context specific vulnerabilities and building community capacities to respond to those threats. Um, so that's 
in a nutshell, the RVP approach to, to this issue. Um, when we look at risk analysis for GBV in this results-based protection uh, paradigm or framework, um, there's a lot of emphasis, particularly um, with organizations that work with interaction on using the risk equation. And so the risk equation, I think you're probably all familiar with, but I just stuck it on the screen for you. Risk being understood as um, threat multiplied by vulnerability divided by community capacity, by which we mean um, GBV rich risk increases as threats increase and it increases as vulnerabilities increase, but it decreases as community capacities to respond to that threat um, are, are improved. Um, so that's really why we put it in that kind of equation format. Um, but the real value of doing this um, is that it's it goes beyond the basic um, assertion that we've identified a risk and challenges us to break down that assertion into its component parts. So instead of just saying, for example, that we know there is sexual violence being committed against IDP women and girls that's being committed by armed actors, um, we go a little bit further and try to unpick what are the threats, vulnerabilities and capacities that underlie that. So in the example on the screen, you might have a context in which sexual violence is being committed by armed actors um, and that we've also noted the prevalence of quite permissive attitudes towards sexual violence amongst those armed actor groups. That's a part of the threat. It's part of the matrix of the, of the profile uh, that makes up that threat for, for people who are vulnerable to, that, to those risks. In terms of vulnerabilities, you might, in one particular scenario, note that people who are collecting firewood during certain times of day on their own are particularly vulnerable to that specific threat. And you might also note that the community themselves have started to sort of mitigate that risk by, for example, purchasing firewood elsewhere on local markets. These are entirely hypothetical examples, but the point is that it unpicks the sort of the richness of our risk analysis and then challenges us to go a little bit further than just simply asserting that we've identified a GBV risk. Um, so there's another example there on the screen that looks at intimate partner violence that I think we'll sort of come back to um, as we go through the, the, the presentation. Um, but really the point is to say that in any given context, you might identify multiple risks and each of those risks has specific threats, vulnerabilities and capacities associated with it. And so when we're doing a risk analysis, it's important to separate out each of the rows of that analysis so that we have a good grip on the, on the real detail of the risks that are being faced by people that we're trying to serve. Um, and so essentially when doing a risk analysis, we encourage organizations to ask some of these critical questions like, what are the different types of GBV that different individuals and groups are facing in this particular area at this particular time or during this crisis? Um, and then what are the perpetrators of each of those individual types of GBV and who's most likely to face those specific threats themselves? So we're already looking at risk, threat and, and vulnerability there. But in addition, we encourage organizations to look at what community members are already doing to try to reduce those threats and then design a program that tries to build upon those pre-existing capacities. And lastly, I think whenever we've done any of the workshops around this with, with organizations in the field, it's impossible to not also spell out some of the underlying factors, some of the things that we understand as driving, um, real fundamental driving factors um, behind that gender-based violence um, that we've observed. So that might be things like harmful traditional practices or underlying beliefs or cultural norms, um, or the, the role of a crisis, like a food insecurity crisis or a displacement crisis that might exacerbate the gender-based violence risk. So these are underlying factors that are not specific threats, vulnerabilities or capacities, but they're still important for us to understand when we're doing a risk analysis. Um, in the framework, the GBV-PEF, the Prevention Evaluation Framework, um, we recommend the use of a risk canvas. This is uh, adapted from the work of ACAPS, um, who uh, designed it specifically with protection in mind. Um, but when applied to GBV risk, it, it makes quite good sense. And really what we're talking about is simply mapping out on the basis of your pre-existing knowledge. So the knowledge that your GBV specialists already have, um, or on the knowledge of interactions that you have with the community already, right? So it's not a question of going out and doing an additional survey. It's about putting down the knowledge that we already have about the GBV risk in a particular context, mapping each of those aspects out 
on a canvas and it could just be drawn up on a two page document with a pen if you really want. Um, but the point is it would cover the critical points that you can see on the screen there. So first of all, what's the overarching profile of the risk that you can see? Um, what is known about the specific GBV risks that are faced by different members of the community? And then the analysis walks through the sections that I just explained to you. So the different types of threat that people are faced with, the different types of vulnerabilities that, that might influence their vulnerability to that particular threat, and then the capacities that the community already has at their disposal to, to mitigate that. I'll walk you through in a moment an example of what this would look like um, filled out. Um, but beyond the analysis, it's also important to think about um, where we think this is gonna go and how we think we can intervene. So where we think this is gonna go, that means looking at the scenario and thinking about the projected evolution purely on the basis of what we already know, what do we think is most likely to happen? So projecting the worst case scenario in say six months time, the best case or the most likely outcome. And then thinking for each of those scenarios, what are the triggers that might make that happen? Because that can help you rationalize and think about some of the external factors that will trigger um, change in, in the community and the risk that we're talking about. Um, and once that's done, we're in a good position to start thinking about how we as an organization can mitigate some of those risks. So we can do that in three kind of boxes, one in terms of reducing the threat, reducing the vulnerability, and also increasing the capacity of the community to, to mitigate those risks. So to give you an example of what that might look like, um, I've got a fictional case here where we're looking at a risk profile in uh, South Sudan, in Warap State. So this is a rural area of South Sudan. There's quite high rates of intimate partner violence, um, women and girls primarily facing intimate violence, uh, intimate partner violence, and that can include physical, sexual violence, discrimination against survivors of such violence, and village-wide acceptance of IPV as a normal part of, of life. That's the basic sort of one sentence summary of the risk profile. But the detail of that comes out below. So the threat is, is primarily male heads of household that are using IPV as a way to um, punish um, their partners during domestic disputes. So it's a violent, a use of violent um, dispute resolution. Um, vulnerability to being married women and, and daughters of unemployed male household heads with limited social networks are observed to be especially vulnerable. So this is hypothetical. We're simply saying that we, you may already know that it's the people that live in the households where the, the, the male household head um, is unemployed or has a limited social network that suffer the greatest um, amount of IPV. Um, and then you may also know something about the community capacities, for example, the use of informal counseling and advice to married couples in church groups in, in a religious, in, a, in this case, a Christian um, area. Um, so that will be a hypothetical breakdown of that risk profile. And then the projected evolution, you might foresee a worsening of IPV and more ostracization of survivors. And that might be triggered by worsening conflict dynamics in the area or increased economic insecurity. A best case example might be the reduction in IPV um, and a sort of community-wide acceptance of, of non-violent forms of dispute resolution. Um, what would be the triggers for that? Well, maybe some positive engagement um, on behalf of the village elders or the faith leaders to try and shift the, the social norms around intimate partner violence. But perhaps we might think that the most likely outcome if we don't intervene is no change in IPV levels at all and continued ostracization of survivors. Um, and what would be the trigger? Well, inaction by village elders, just a continuation of the, of the status quo. Um, so then on that basis, we can think about, well, we could try to reduce the threat by shifting norms and beliefs around IPV amongst men and boys. Um, we could try to reduce vulnerability by improving the livelihood options and the social networks of unemployed male household heads on the basis of our analysis at the top of the page. Or we could try to increase community capacity by increasing the appreciation of village elders and faith leaders of the harm that is done by IPV and therefore their potential role and the positive effect that may have if they help to mitigate that risk. So that's a purely hypothetical example of what a risk canvas might look like if done in the way that interaction and the results-based protection community are describing. Um, so what I would like to do 
right now is ask you all to go into breakout groups. And Ife, don't worry, Ife will, will put you all into different breakout groups. Um, but once we go into those groups, um, I'm going to ask you to think about what I've just presented. Um, and I'll explain to you how you'll get to see what I've just presented when we're, when we're doing this exercise. But um, I'm just going to ask you to think about how you and your organization currently analyze GBV risk in, in project documents or program documents or planning processes. How do you currently do it? Um, what kinds of tools do you use to, to do that? Do you already use the risk equation to map out GBV risk? Or do you use the socioeconomic model? Or do you use a combination or a special alternative approach that you have in your organization? What are the forms that you guys use for analyzing GBV risk? Um, and then also, given what you're currently doing, what are the biggest challenges that you see in doing it well? Like what's, what's hardest when it comes to doing GBV risk analysis? And then what types of tools do you use? So are these on the basis of informal discussions, formalized surveys, focus groups, how do you go about doing that work? Um, so those are the questions that I'm gonna to put to you, but before I, I hand you over to Ife, I just wanna explain the way that we're gonna go about working the, um, the breakout groups for today and, and, and on Thursday as well. We're gonna use Mural, and for anybody who's not familiar with it, we'll have links in the chat so you can click on the correct link for your breakout group. Ife will explain all of that to you, to you. But once you do that, you'll see a screen like this and it'll ask you to uh, join, join the group that you're in um, and you can put your name in or you can join in my case as a visiting goat um, and just click enter as visitor. Just that's all you need to do, enter as a visitor. You don't need to log in. You don't need to give us any information or data or anything like that. You can just click enter as visitor and get rid of that gate, get started thing on the right. And then you'll see this, a big- hey, Neil. Canvas. Yes. Hello. Sorry, Neil. We can't see your screen. We still see the PowerPoint. Well, I'm very glad you told me that. Um, right. Let me <laughs> let, let me switch that around then. Um, uh, let me see. Right. How about now? Yes, we can. But do you mind yeah. zooming in a little? <laughs> of course. Of course. So the point is just that when you first click on it you'll be asked to click on as a visitor so just click join as visitor and then you'll see this um, big canvas here you just zoom in um, and you will be able to see different parts that you can work on so at the top i've got some basic background documents you don't need to look at any of that for this exercise you just need to look at breakout session one how does this relate to your work and there's some instructions are in there that you can follow um, and some key the key questions i've just discussed will be there what I'd like you to do is to use this canvas and fill in your thoughts in these yellow sticky notes down here in answer to those questions, and then nominate somebody from, from your group to report back to the, to the plenary so we can have a good discussion about it. So those are your tasks, and you've got 10 minutes. Thanks for taking part in those breakouts. I know the first breakout is always difficult because you don't know your group members and you don't know how to work the mural and it's all the sort of the, the first tests. Um, so I bounced between the rooms and it looked like we were getting conversations going in each group. That's good to see. Um, and the mural boards certainly have been active. So what I'd like to do very briefly, because we need to move on to the proxy indicator stuff, I'd just like to get a little feedback from each of the groups. So can I go in reverse order and just ask the group three, if you chose somebody to speak, can I ask that person just to give me a very brief summary of, of um, sort of the, the key challenges that your group saw in terms of doing risk analysis well? So that's group three. Can you give me some, some challenges to doing risk analysis well? Yeah, sure. Hold on. I'm just uh, zooming in here so that I can see. Sorry. Um, yeah, so some of the challenges that came up in our group were just um, the lack of uh, figures and data that had been reported on and whatnot, um, but also some of that lack of official data feeding into perceptions that um, was data kind of official enough or worthy to be included. Um, and then uh, let's see, some of the other things were just around GBV risks being normalized in the context. Um, and that being a factor. Uh, and then of course, limited access, um, particularly in conflict affected areas as well um, for primary data collection. 
Thank you. I appreciate each of those points and that indeed, you know, they've been raised in all of the workshops that we did when building the, the PEF. Um, I think a lot of the stuff on access and data quality, I, I would encourage you if you haven't to look at the PEF um, and to look at some of the ways that we tried to, uh, it's not minimize, but kind of find workarounds to ensure that you get the best out of the data that's available. Um, without stretching or going beyond it and making assertions that the data doesn't support. That was certainly one of our sort of primary concerns when we were, when we were thinking about risk analysis and, and monitoring tools. Um, okay, so how about we look at group uh, two? Can I ask you to just share some of the challenges that you that you saw and some of the approaches that you, you shared amongst, amongst the uh, members of the group? Group two, could you tell me a bit about the challenges that you saw, but also the tools that you use or the approaches that you use to do risk analysis? So that's to group two. I'm getting the sense that you didn't decide someone who'd be brave enough to step forward. Uh, Harriet, over to you. Sorry, Neil, we were on mute. Uh, so we looked at some of the challenges included the context, so where there's active conflict or we have an emergency and barriers like culture, religion, politics and security situation. And then we looked at the population that is at risk, who is vulnerable, who is not vulnerable, ETC, and then the prevalent norms surrounding the communities. This could be like some of the challenges that would be barriers to, you know, having a, a good risk, GBV risk analysis, or how we analyze, sorry, how we analyze our risk, our GBV, GBV risks in our project documents. Sorry. That's oh, perfect, Harriet. And did you come up with any kind of tools to tackle those challenges or just examples of what people in your group currently do um, when doing risk analysis? So we, we looked at the tools, I think we ran out of time, but we looked at the tools that uh, we would use to address the GBV risk. So we have screening tools uh, that would screen any type of GBV in, in different entry points. So some of the, the screening tools at health facilities at the community levels. And then we looked at uh, the safety audit tools, which has, so the safety audit tool can be observational or it can have three parts. One is uh, it has a key AI uh, feedback and another one has a focus group discussion. Thank you, uh, that's really useful. So again, this is the kind of thing that came up when we were designing the PEF. Um, and what we saw was that there were lots of tools like that that were pre-existing that could potentially feed into this kind of risk analysis. But what seemed to be most important was that we think about dedicating some analytical time to really using that stuff to get a good, rich understanding of the GBV risk. So rather than just having, and I'm not saying this is what you do or you're proposing, but rather than just having a safety audit sort of replace or try to do what a GBV risk analysis does, actually think about how we can tailor that safety audit and perhaps build on it and draw in from other sources to try and build up a good sort of detailed picture of the risk, threat, vulnerability and capacities um, that are faced by the communities being served. Um, okay, thanks for the thumbs up, Harriet. The last one, I think, is group one. Do you have anything you want to add? I would just open it to you, uh, to your brave soul who's prepared to come back to us and just tell us, did you see any kind of challenges that haven't been discussed so far or any tools or approaches um, that were discussed in your group that we, that we could throw into the pot here? Over to you, group one. Um, yeah, so we noted a couple of things. Some of it has already been, been mentioned by you and others. So in terms of not necessarily having the time to, um, you know, completely do these full analyses, particularly as, um, yeah, in our project cycle and particularly with proposals, we often just aren't able to dedicate that. Um, another aspect we talked about was capacity on the ground. Um, so we don't necessarily always have either the expertise or um, even the human resources to, um, to do these sorts of tools um, and analyses correctly. So in terms of data collectors, you know, uh, since it's sensitive, we might want female ones only, and then they may not be available, this sort of thing. Um, and I think those were the main points that we discussed. Um, yeah, that, and then also yeah. in terms of the analysis, sometimes we just don't necessarily have the, 
the skills and capacities on on the ground. Uh, yeah, uh, I hear you. So when we were doing the PEF, we came across that kind of issue uh, linked also to the sort of implications of privacy and data sensitivity, because of course, when we're talking about GBV, as you said, the, the, the act of collecting that data is quite difficult. But then of course, you've got a question about how you manage and share that data. And you, you can't just treat it as regular data that can be fed into a monitoring system and passed around an organization openly. Um, and so in some cases, what we saw was the use of pre-existing uh, program approaches to try and feed data in, in a limited way. So for example, places where you had uh, a pre-existing presence in a community for a couple of years and your community outreach team who might be providing um, sort of responsive care to people who are at risk to, G to GBV, acting as people that can help you build up some picture of that GBV risk um, in an informal way and in an aggregated way rather than discussing individual cases of risk. Um, and the kind of the limits around that and the privacy issues are all described in, in the PEF framework. I think that's an important thing to think about. But what's in, vital to understand is that the level of analysis we're talking about here is something that we think can be done in that manner. So if, if you're talking to somebody who has a presence on the ground and they don't need to give you detailed individual case studies, what they need to do is give you an overarching picture of the risk and who the key vulnerabilities are in order to feed into your design um, process as, as you already have. Um, so those were the main thoughts around some of those challenges that we saw when designing the PEF. Um, anybody got any other points they want to throw in before we move on to looking at proxy indicators in some detail? Uh, if so, just turn on your camera or raise your hand or turn on your mic and speak. Is there anybody that wants to add something that we haven't discussed already? Okay, great. So um, as I go on, I'm going to talk through proxy indicators and, and what they are. Do not hesitate. If you've got a question, put it into the chat and, and Kerry or Ife will, will flag it to me. Um, or if you're bold, just turn on your mic and interrupt me. I'd be very happy to take uh, interruptions as we go. So um, let me just check. Can you see the screen? Ife, can you tell me if you're seeing the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. You're good to go. Grand. Thank you. Um, so what we need to know are what exactly proxy indicators are and then what they're not. That's the main task right now. So really, when we talk about proxy indicators, we're just talking about indirect measures. That's it. It's just an indicator that indirectly measures a thing that we want to know about. Um, you use them when direct measurement of that thing is not possible, ethical, or feasible. Um, so of course, they tend to be used in cases where you're looking at hard, hard to measure outcomes and hard, hard to measure change. Um, so protection is a classic case for this kind of thing. Um, advocacy activities are often, sometimes they, they use proxy indicators because it's quite hard to pin down the particular change that you're after. If you're talking about wider social norms change, things like that. Um, so anywhere where it's difficult to directly measure the change you're trying to bring about, that's the kind of place where proxy indicators are useful. Um, what the indicators do is they track changes that will go hand in hand with the, train, the change that you're trying to measure. So you want a proxy indicator that will not be sort of uh, randomly associated with the thing that you're trying to measure. You want one that will reliably change as the thing that you're trying to measure changes. So examples, um, you might want to use, instead of understanding intimate partner violence, the risk of intimate partner violence, if you're unable to directly measure that or directly measure the prevalence of, of intimate partner violence, for example, in a community, because you cannot couldn't, you don't have the time, space, or uh, skill sets, or people on the ground to do a, a statistically relevant survey of, of intimate partner violence. Instead, you might want to try and measure some of the things that go hand in hand with the risk of intimate partner violence. So, for example, you might look at social attitudes towards the permissibility of such violence in, in the wider community. Or if you're looking at um, early forced marriage, and you, you don't have the ability to go and do a proper survey of, of how many people are, are in this situation, you might want to look at something that you understand to be related to the, the use of early enforced marriage. So for example, that may be 
levels of insecurity, economic insecurity at household level. It may be that in the context in question, that correlates well with the uh, use of early enforced marriage. Um, or if you're trying to measure the risk of gender-based sort of uh, physical assault, you might want to look at the levels of social isolation of persons who, who have non-conforming gender identities. Um, these are quite controversial examples because if you just put them on a table like that, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and I think the immediate response would be, well, how do you know? How do you know that this goes hand in hand with the risk in question? So the point is that none of these suggestions are generalizable. They're not based on a, a worldwide survey that, sh that proves that social isolation of people with non-conforming gender identities increases their risk of physical assault. The point is that to do that, to use that as a proxy, it needs to be based on a context specific analysis of what the risk factors are for the community that you're trying to serve in that particular context. So the point is, this needs to be built off some form of theory of change or some evidence about what drives the particular gender-based violence risk that you're looking at. Um, so just to sort of stand back and think about that, um, it does give us a couple of challenges. Um, you know, the, the first is that we're not directly measuring the thing that we're trying to change. So that obviously throws up lots of questions about how useful they are. Um, it's also true that they can only really tell us about one aspect of the gender-based violence risk. So if I'm thinking about um, socioeconomic drivers of intimate partner violence, um, that one single indicator on its own is only going to tell me about one particular aspect of GBV risk. There might be lots of other drivers of the risk that I'm looking at that aren't covered by that proxy indicator. So that's another challenge for, with, with this approach. And then lastly, um, it's important to understand what I just said, that you can only really assume that these indicators relate to GBV risk on the basis of evidence that you already have. So that might be studies or academic studies into the, the correlates, the drivers, uh, and the correlates of, of GBV risk, or it might be a specific theory of change or a risk analysis that you and your teams have done in the context that you're working in. So if you've built out a risk canvas in quite some detail and you've become familiar with the community you're working in and you have some reason to believe in the validity of that risk canvas, you can start to use that as a basis for your understanding of the underlying factors that are driving GBV risk and then use that to build out proxy indicators. Um, but without that level of evidence or theoretical analysis, it's very difficult to build a good set of proxy indicators. Um, so when you do have that kind of theory and when you do have that kind of analysis, what organizations typically do is try to overcome some of these challenges by bundling together several different proxy indicators. So instead of just looking at you know, um, social isolation, as a, as a proxy for risk of um, uh, physical assault, you might look at social isolation of people um, with non-conforming gender identities and social norms around no, um, non-conforming identities in the community in question and the legal framework around um, the punishment of physical violence that's um, particularly targeting particular gender identities. You'd look at a range of different indicators to try and build quite a rich picture of the different aspects that are involved in that particular GBV risk. That's when these things are strong. When you have a, a, a risk analysis that you can build them from and a whole basket, a whole bundle of different indicators that can tell you quite a few different things about what's happening in the community in question. Um, so that's what proxy indicators are. That's the main challenges that people face when they're trying to build them. Um, I think it's important to think about what they're not. Because often you see people describing something as a proxy indicator when it's not quite that. So typically that happens in two ways. One is when people look at unintended consequences. So there are examples of, of projects where I've seen where you've had a kind of um, a community engagement activity um, that might be looking at one form of GBV. In the case on the screen, I've got intimate partner violence, but it could be any form of GBV activity that has an unintended consequence, for example, by having that community get engagement around gender norms, you might start to shift people's understanding of the rights of, of women and girls to education and therefore increase the number of, of girls over the age of 12 who are attending school. Even though that might not have been the objective of what you're trying to do, that might have happened simply because of the nature of the social norms change that you're working on with that community. 
that's not really a proxy indicator. So you wouldn't want to measure the number of children, uh, of, sorry, girls over the age of 12 attending school as a measure of your success in tackling the norms that underlie intimate partner violence. Why not? Well, because that relationship with the work you're doing on IPV and the attendance of girls in schools is untested. You, you didn't know about it before you started doing this project. You haven't seen it in that context before, and it's quite hard for you to uh, justify the sort of relationship that you see between school attendance and IPV reduction. Um, so really, when you're thinking about proxy indicators, you don't want to be thinking about new learning. You want to be thinking about something that's reliable. You know, so a silly example would be I'm using the proxy of counting the number of people who are carrying umbrellas as a proxy of what the weather forecast looks like. Why? Well, because we we know we already know that people carry umbrellas when it's going to rain, right? It's not some kind of untested new ground. We're looking for something that's reliable that we've seen many, many times before. So unintended consequences don't quite fit that category, even though they're kind of similar because they feel like they're indirect measures. Then they're, they're not. What you need to have is something that is indirect and with which you are already familiar when you're designing the program. The second type of thing that doesn't quite work as a proxy indicator is measuring activities and outputs. So again, you might see an IPV program where you have community awareness raising taking place, um, and then a program might measure the number of people that were in the training or took part in the training or the number of trainings that are delivered or something along those lines. That's not a proxy because it's not measuring a change in the lived experiences of people in the community that you're trying to serve. And you can't assume that the successful delivery of your activities and the numbers of people reached by your activities is gonna lead to a reduction in risk without doing the evaluation, right? So the evaluation is there to try and prove that by doing those activities, you led to that risk reduction. So you can't count the activities as a proxy for the risk reduction itself, because that's the thing you're trying to assess. Um, so it's all a bit abstract, but it's important that we understand that by proxy indicators, we mean something that's happening in the world, in the lived experiences of people in the community in question. And we mean something that we already know on the basis of our understanding of risk in that community is related to GBV risk. That, that's a proxy indicator. And that's, that's the kind of thing we want to work with. Um, so what makes for a good, a good proxy indicator? Um, what we want to make sure is that the, the indicator is directly observable. So we, we're struggling to measure the incidence or the prevalence of intimate partner violence, uh, but we might be able to measure something else directly. So therefore that proxy indicator has to be directly observable. So things that are not directly observable will be things like the attitudes of armed leaders, for example, towards sexual violence, uh, unless you, can actually do a reliable survey on that. It's quite hard to directly observe those attitudes and beliefs that people hold in their hearts and their, in their minds. Um, the behavior of perpetrators towards survivors inside the home is another thing that's quite hard to observe directly. You can indirectly observe it, but it's quite hard to directly observe it. Or the private feelings of community leaders towards intimate partner violence. Again, these are all hard things that are direct, hard things to directly measure themselves. But examples of things that are directly observable would be actual instances of arms carriers, soldiers or arms carriers being held to account for sexual violence. So you might not be able to assess the attitudes of the leaders of those armed groups, but you might be able to directly observe the fact that those armed, those leaders have actually held to account members of their, of their units for sexual violence. That's a thing you can directly observe. Um, Commitments by community members to use nonviolent dispute resolution. You can measure those commitments because you can go out and ask people about those commitments. It's much easier to measure and to directly observe than the sort of behavior towards people within the home. Or lastly, increasing attention to um, processes, the processing of intimate partner violence within the court system. That might be easier to observe because you can look at the data about what's been discussed in those courts as opposed to the private feelings of community leaders or judiciary members um, within that community. So the point is that what we need to make sure is that we have a really clear, directly observable um, phenomenon 
for uh, a proxy indicator. And the last point, or the second point I would say is that it's important to think about that bundle that I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna pause here. Um, Harriet, I see you've raised your hand. Do you have a question you want to add? Yes, Neil. Uh, my question is, can the, because you've talked about the indicators that are directly observable, what if we can observe, okay, so let me give this example so that maybe it will be able to explain what I'm saying. If we are trying to measure or reduce transactional sex and intimate partner violence through economic empowerment, so would that be a proxy indicator where it serves the purpose of addressing two different types of GBV? And we can actually say, because of uh, economically empowering women in this in community X, we've seen the rates of transactional sex go down and the rates of intimate partner violence go down. Would that be a proxy indicator? So just to check, what's the proxy that you're proposing? Levels of economic security? Yes, or livelihoods. Yes, right. economic Liv empowerment, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Um, so I would say, so I referred to what I was saying earlier, that there's no general answer to this stuff. It depends on your specific analysis. So it's that if you have pre-existing evidence about the correlation between economic empowerment and was it, did I hear you rightly, that it was, um, was it early forced marriage that you were trying to approach? Intimate partner violence and, uh, Sorry, and transactional sex, yeah. Right, IPV and transactional sex. So if you have that clear evidence in that community in question, then it looks, it starts to sound like a potentially good proxy indicator um, because you already know that it relates, that, that, that it's one of the causal factors. If you don't have that analysis and that you're sort of going out experimentally trying to find out if it's related, then it's obviously a bad idea because that's what you're trying to learn. But if you already have some evidence about the relationship between the two, it's potentially quite good. And to come back to some of the other tests that we had, um, it's good because it's not an activity. E economic empowerment is not the delivery of cash, right? Economic empowerment is actually about the degree to which an, um, a, a person or a community or a household is empowered economically in their lives. So if you have a measure of that change in their life, rather than just the delivery of your activities or the number of people reached with the cash distribution or whatever it is, that wouldn't work. But if you have an actual measure of the change of empowerment in somebody's life, then that's good. The one hesitation I would say is that economic empowerment is quite a hard thing to measure with a good metric. Um, that's a whole discussion about measurement of, of resilience and, and topics like that. But assuming you, you have a good tool for measuring that stuff, it's potentially a good example for, for what we're talking about, yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, good. So I can't see the chat. So please, Kerry, Ife, uh, do interrupt me if there are other things in the chat that are coming up. Um, but just to move on to this point about bundles, um, what I would say is that, as we said earlier, proxies only tell you about this one angle. It's that old tale about the elephant. And if you, you know, if you, if you have lots of people blindfolded, they can't tell exactly what the elephant is and it looks different if you hold a different part of it. That's all very true for proxy indicators because you're looking at, to take Harriet's example, the aspect of economic empowerment that is related to IPV, but there's a lot more to IPV than that. So really you want to think about a bundle of indicators, some of which are about economic empowerment, but others might be about social isolation or they might be about involvement of vulnerable groups within the household in community decision-making. You wanna think about a spread across different sectors of analysis, not just looking at one classic humanitarian delivery sector, but really looking across the, the different domains of somebody's lived experience to put together a bundle of measurements that you can use to look at GBV risk. Um, so you might think about um, uh, markers of community attitudes towards early forced marriage or towards IPV, that might be an aspect of your bundle that relates to the threat that's posed to, to the people in question. Or you might look at levels of economic insecurity at household level or economic empowerment inversely. That's to do with the vulnerability that people face towards IPV. Or you might look at the kind of awareness of alternative sources of income for insecure households. And that might be related to the capacity of the community to deal with economic insecurity without um, uh, moving towards a GPV uh, risk situation. 
Um, so that's a bundle of indicators. It's three different indicators that are partly about the threats, partly about the vulnerabilities, partly about the capacities. And it's the heterogeneous mixed nature of those indicators that makes this a good bundle. Um, and so the classic phrase that people use in the social sciences is, is to say that these indicators, when taken together, they collaborate. They actually tell you a bit about the socioeconomic background, a little bit about, um, in these cases, the mostly socioeconomic, but they tell you a little bit about the socioeconomic drivers and also the capacities of the community to mitigate the risk and a little bit about other, other aspects, social isolation or something like that. Um, and by bringing together those different fields, they collaborate to tell you about the thing you're trying to measure. Uh, other people, other scientists call them rich pictures because they tell you about information in lots of different domains of analysis. Um, so that's really what, what people look for when they're trying to design a good set of proxy indicators. It's not just lots of indicators of, indi of economic empowerment. It's one about economic empowerment. It's one about social isolation. It's one about um, democratic involvement in, in decision-making processes. It's, it's a good spread of information. Um, in terms of strengths and weaknesses, just quickly, um, typically proxies are seen as being good for measuring, hard to measure stuff, um, good for a situation where uh, you don't have direct measures for the thing you're looking at, um, and, and good where you have a mixed bag, where the data isn't very good, where you don't have lots of good surveys that you can already rely on. Those are the kinds of places where um, uh, proxy indicators are most useful. They're not that strong um, if you only have one proxy indicator, because it will only tell you one part of the picture. Um, they're not that strong if you don't have good evidence or at least program theory to back up the correlation that you're assuming between the proxy and the thing you're measuring. And they're not that strong um, if you don't invest in interpretation. So you do have to take some time to think about what this bundle of tools tells you about the thing you're trying to measure. Um, so we're going to move on to breakout exercise number two. Um, so I'll pass you back to Ife again. What I'd like you to do is just look at the same board, the same mural board that you had before, but scroll down to the bottom of it. Breakout exercise two, um, it asks you to think about when you would use proxy indicators and when you would not. So what I've done is at the bottom of the screen, there's some post-it notes with project descriptions, very brief project descriptions. And then I want you to drag them across to put them into the side of use a proxy indicator or don't use a proxy indicator. So you need to pick up the, the post-it notes and mess around with them a little bit, um, but that's your task. And um, we have approximately 20 minutes. Hey guys, uh, it was interesting jumping between groups there. I think we had some good chats going on. Um, as I said in the groups, I think the real value here is the why. Why do you think it goes on one side or the other? Um, so let's just have a brief conversation because we don't have that long left. What I'd like to do is check in with, uh, let me see, can I start with group one? Um, if you could just have your brave volunteer who's prepared to come back and, and tell us a little bit about how you allocated them and why you put them where you did. Um, it might help if I share my screen so that everybody can see your mural board. Ife, can you see group one's mural board? Yes, I can. Do you mind zooming in a little? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we'll have to manage this as best as we can. Is that a bit easier to read? Yes, it's a bit easier to read. Yes, thanks, Neil. Thanks. So group one, over to you. Can you talk me through what you did? Come on, somebody in group one. Did you not choose someone to be brave? Uh, is there anybody that could talk me through um, the decisions that you made there? I'll give it a try. Um, Papala is my background is a bit noisy. Um, but I thought, uh, I think uh, the, the thing that we thought about is the project four, which we said you can use proxy indicators, given the sensitivities around the, uh, the discussion around and sexual, and sexual violence. So it then becomes difficult to then get direct indicators yeah, in that case because of those sensitivities. So then the option will be to use uh, proxy indicators. Uh, then I think the other one we have certain was also in the project one, which we said do not use, do not use proxy indicators given that uh, this project has been implemented many times and there's obviously uh, some information around the context and around, around, the, um, around the, uh, the work that is being done. 
So in this case, it might be easy, it might be easy to then just direct you know, measure directly whatever you are, you are implementing and not use proxy indicators in that case. So I think those are the two yeah. that we... Thank you. Thank you, Stanford. That's really good. I'm just cutting in because you're right that the background noise is quite hard. So thank you for doing that. Um, just to summarize, project four, group number one, project four, the one that's on um, sexual violence in a community where discussing rape and sexual violence is difficult as a case to use proxy indicators. And they put project one, the one where we're just doing cash um, to meet basic needs for IDPs as a don't use project indicators. I think the logic is pretty sound. So on project four, we know that it's hard to talk about the thing that we're trying to measure. So proxy indicators look like a good way to go. Instead of asking people to talk about sexual violence and experiences of rape, what we're gonna do is look for other things that our risk analysis or our pre-existing evidence tells us is related to those things and try and measure them instead. Classic proxy indicator case. The other case of project one was the, uh, the joker in the pack project one. I, it's a weird one. It's not really to do with GBV, but it wouldn't really be an obvious case for proxy indicators because there's plenty of other direct measures that you can use to understand the degree to which your cash distribution has met basic needs for displaced people uh, in, a, in an IDP camp or something. Um, obviously, it depends on the context, but in most cases, you might have lots of things that you can use for direct measurement of the change you're trying to bring about there. Um, so that would make sense, not using proxy indicators in that case. Let's pass to group two. Um, can I ask you to just talk me through, apart from project four and project one, maybe you could just tell me about two of the projects that you had um, allocated and just tell me about why you put them where you put them. So that's group, group number two. Can you pick out a couple of projects to tell us about? Um. I'll go ahead and talk about one, and if my colleagues would like to come in, they're more than welcome to do so. Uh, to you, speak Sean. of project three, it's about a GVV prevention that we already have an in-depth risk analysis, including the driving factors that it's affecting the targeted community, and we have a rich specific theory of change. This we put under using the proxy indicator because we believe it's going to help us to measure things that are difficult to directly measure, such as changes in attitude and behavior. Um, uh, so this is my input for project three. Um, yeah. Shan, that, that makes really good sense. So what we're picking on there is the depth of knowledge that you have about what drives GBV in that context. That means that you're likely to be able to bring about or to design some proxy indicators on that basis. Am I understanding you correctly? Am I hearing you yes. right? Yes, exactly. Great. Great. I mean, the other thing to think about with that project is, do you need to, you know? So the way that the project's described, I'm leading you to one thought, which you picked up on clearly, is that you can use proxy indicators in that case. The other question to ask is, do you have to? Because in a sense, there's still a plan B. It's still not ideal. So it might be that you've got this great risk analysis, but you've also got a bunch of really clear direct measures of the thing that you're trying to change. It, it may yeah. be the case, you know, in which case you don't really need to lean on proxies. But if that's not the case, it looks like you've got a really solid basis for building them. So it's kind of like a project where you can, but you don't know if you should, um, at least on the basis of that tiny sentence in that post-it note. Um, does anybody else from that group want to talk about any of the other projects in the list? Okay. Um, well, I tell you what. Let's yeah, move on to the last. Uh, Neil, the last. Oh, Neil, hello. Neil, one general comment, uh, because yes. I, I mentioned it in the group where I was that sometimes yep. you may even be able to determine a direct indicator. However, sometimes due to cost implications of uh, you know collecting that data, we opt to have a proxy indicator instead because maybe it's more cost effective, and so sometimes the decision is just cost driven. Yes, Wycliffe. Thanks for adding that. So. Right at the beginning of the presentation on proxies, I said you use them where direct measurement is not possible. That's too quick. You're right. It's where they're not possible or feasible or preferable for some reason like cost effectiveness. Um, so you're right. People might try to use a proxy because it's more cost effective. Um, but I would also say that we need to think about data quality first and foremost. So in, in a case where we're just trying to save pennies, rather than getting high quality data, you know, that we have to ask ourselves if that's the right um, way to go. But certainly cost effectiveness might be one of the reasons to use proxies um, that we haven't discussed in depth. So thanks for adding that. 
Um, let me pass lastly to Neil? the last group. Yes. Sorry, Neil, yes. there is one question in the chat from Susan. She's asking a, um, for project three, can we use both types of indicators, uh, a hybrid of sorts? Perfect, yes. So proxies are really good at this, this kind of thing. They're really good at adding to what you've already got. So you definitely don't need to think undoing a proxy measurement system versus a direct measurement system, not at all. If you have some direct measures of the type of change you're looking at in project three, so this is GBV reduction, um, yes, if you can measure those direct changes and then maybe add on some proxies as well, that will build the richness of your picture. So absolutely, hybrid approaches are encouraged in this kind of work. Um, and the real value of using proxies is if you go back to your risk analysis, you might have direct measures of threat, you might have direct measures of vulnerability, but you might have nothing on community capacity, in which case you want to start building a proxy, proxy there. So it's about adding richness, it's about adding breadth to your picture. Uh, that's where the real value comes. But we need to do group three before we close up. So group three, over to you. Um, can I ask you to have a, a volunteer who's brave enough just to talk me through some of the decisions that you made here, perhaps, perhaps pick on one project we haven't discussed yet. Over to you, group three. Why did you make these decisions? Sure, I can I can jump in there. Um, we looked at project two. This is the GBV project that was kind of designed in a hurry um, with limited evidence and, and no real theory of change. We put this under don't use proxy indicators, um, partly because we thought we'd have um, real difficulty developing them because of the limited um, the limited evidence to do so and, and the lack of a theory of change. So we thought that would be a, re a really tough one to develop some proxy indicators on. Um, the other one we looked at was project five um, to look at reducing sexual violence by armed actors where there's a reporting mechanism that's long established, widely used and comprehensive in coverage. And for this one, yeah, we leaned towards not um, because it sounds like we may have direct data that could be used through this reporting mechanism, provided that that mechanism gives us usable data for, for what we're looking at. Um, so that's where we landed on those two. Perfect, Kerry, thank you. So I'll just pass to Zuleika in a moment because she's raised her hand, but absolutely. So I would say in project two, you're essentially saying you can't use proxies because you don't have the data or the risk analysis to do it. And in project five, you're saying you don't need to because it looks like the, the reporting mechanism would do the job that you're trying to serve. Um, I'd agree with both of those points. I would add that in project five, you still might be able to. So it comes back to that point about hybrid approaches. If you feel that there's an area of your risk analysis that you're not learning about from the reporting mechanism, then you might wanna think about proxies as a kind of last gasp attempt to try and learn something about one aspect of that risk profile. Um, but absolutely, I see the logic that you're presenting there. Zuleika, I see your, your, your hand is up. Can I pass over to you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I had for you a question about this project five because while listening to to Kerry and this was what we discussed in the group, I was thinking that the data we have coming from the reporting mechanisms is talking more about the response, but the project aims at reducing sexual violence. So um, maybe in terms of prevention, we would need uh, different data, right? So uh, the, the question was about, yes, if you would agree on using a hybrid approach here. Yeah, I think it, it depends, you know, and these, these post-it notes are too short to really give a proper answer. But I mean, it depends on the type of data you get from the reporting mechanism, because it might give you good information about the prevalence of sexual violence, which you could then use as a direct measure of whether your prevention program is succeeding. Um, on the other hand, it might give you patchy information about prevalence, but it might give you something about some of the driving factors or some of the issues around sexual violence, in which case you might want to try and add to that. Um, but definitely, I would say that you want to think in hybrid terms um, and think about proxies as a kind of strategic tool that you've got where the data is weak. And one of the reasons why it's so strong is that we saw a lot of cases of organizations for various different reasons, not having a comprehensive view of the risk profile. And so 
not you know bearing in mind that we can use proxies where it's difficult to directly measure is one way to overcome that um so it responds to that problem of well i can't directly measure this because people can't talk about it or i can't directly measure armed actor activities because of security concerns the point is there are other things that you can try to look at if you have a good risk assessment in place um so that's the main learning from this and i appreciate we're a little bit over time so I would just say thank you all for a really good first session. Um, what we're going to do on Thursday when we come back is to go through a fictional GBV prevention project um, and then try designing some proxy indicators for that project in your breakout groups. So it's going to be, I think, quite good fun. Um, and we'll have a discussion of why, you know, what thoughts we had when we were doing that design process and what the challenges were before we look at interpreting data from these proxy indicators. So it's thinking about how they relate to the risk equation that we looked at at the beginning. So that's what we're doing on Thursday. It's really the kind of the nitty gritty, the harder stuff, really. Um, but I think there's a lot of learning to, to come out from that type of session. So I look forward to seeing you all on Thursday. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for sticking with us as we ran over time. Um, I wish you all uh, an excellent end of day, where whichever time zone you're in. Um, and I'll see you again in Thursday. Take care. Bye.